All right. Um, so let me uh, make um, one correction from last time. We were talking about the fitted frame, the TNB frame for a space curve, remember? And this diagram shows what it is. That is to say, if you take, if you will, three points, you take the, the point P and uh, a point along the curve, epsilon along the curve, and another point, epsilon along the curve on the, in the other direction, and you let, let those be epsilon, very small, and you fit a, a plane, or put another way, a circle to those three points, <coughs> you get the, the TN plane. And, and then orthogonal to that, you get the binormal B. And that frame I said last time was named after Darbu, and I misspoke. It's named after Frenet. Uh, there are two two major names uh, associated with space curve, the math of space curves, and I picked the wrong one. It's called a Frenet frame. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the guy who figured out what the hinge of that normal is is Darbu, but Frenet got the frame named after him. Okay. Um, so enough about that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about computing the, the principal directions and principal curvatures. And I'm going to talk about doing that for two different uh, representations. On the one hand, a tiled representation of the surface, and on the other hand, a parameterized. We have an actual, actual equations, uh, x of u, v, y of u, v, z of u, v. <clears throat> Um, in order to understand the um, what tail is tiles or the temptation? Like triangular tiles, oh, okay. you know, mm. polygonal tiles, okay. uh, typically triangular tiles. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Okay, so at any given point on the surface, we can draw a little circle. It doesn't have to be little, but we'll, but we'll be eventually making it little about that point. So the point on the surface is here on the, on the surface, and we're going to draw a little circle around it. Okay, so here's a... There's a point on the surface, and I'm going to draw a little circle around it. Okay, and it doesn't, and it's not critical that it be a circle. It can be any closed curve, but we'll make it be a circle. Uh, so at at one place, let's call it P, which is marked here on the uh, whoop. to do. Yeah, I guess I'll do that. This place here, we're going to write any vector we want in the tangent plane at that point. Okay? And that point is going to be, this is the tangent plane over here, and there's that vector in that tangent plane. I cannot do the law. So this, this is the tangent plane at that point, and this is that vector seen as being on the tangent plane. Okay? So the, and now what we're going to do is as we, as we walk around the circle, we're going to rotate the tangent plane every time so that the new tangent plane, so that it fits onto the same tangent plane, the, the original tangent plane, right? <clears throat> Understand what I'm saying? So as we walk along the circle, the, the tangent plane, the, ta the tangent plane will change. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to project this vector right back down onto the original tangent plane. And we keep doing that little section by little section. So what we're doing is we're flattening out as we go around. The very same vector. We just keep the vector the same. So like any vector. Pick, pick a vector, and as we walk around, so this inner curve, this inner curve is the curve we're walking around, this inner piece of the circle. And we're just carrying this vector along with us. And it's just going to stay the same. OK? Um, <coughs> the, so when we finish, OK, so in order to allow us to um, do the flattening, we have to sort of slice open. We have to slice open the, uh, the circle at the starting point in order to flatten it out, because it's going to be a, a cone, if you will. I mean, not a cone, because it's got a, flat, a flattened out part of this. In order to get it to flatten, we, we've got to pull it apart, right? <clears throat> um, and this, the effect is that when we pull it back on the cone, this and this are not going to be the same anymore, right? Because <clears throat> We had we had something like this, and and this guy this guy was pointing like that here. But once we pull the same thing open this way, when as we rotate them back this way, they end up not being the same vector. Okay. Now, this is this is parallel transport. It's Parallel transport just says, ignore the curvature. Ignore the curvature. Act as if everything was flat. And when you do that, you end up with a different vector after the end, as you see on the left-hand part of the screen, after you've completed your circuit, as compared to the one you started with. They were the same in a flattened out sense, but they aren't the same on the surface. And there's a, so there's an, a di an angle between those two, yeah? So if I choose the vector along the direction where yeah, I scale this uh, apart, then the, after I locate this vector along the circle, it should be the same. It won't be the same. It'll be the same on the tangent plane, um, same on this flattened plane, but it won't be the same uh, in the non-flattened plane. Like if I choose a direction like in the middle of these two directions. Doesn't doesn't matter. Whichever direction you choose, it will it will end up off by the very same angle. And the angle that that angle of change, that delta angle, okay, <laughs> is going to be. Describe, um, I do with a black pen. Well, use another color. Uh, okay. Do you remember our equation d omega 1, 2 is equal to minus k uh, dA? What's going on is that as we're walking along this path, we're getting a spin in the tangent plane. So we, we have a frame as we walk along the path. The normal is pointing to me here in this example. Here's the walking direction. And as I walk along the, the plane, the I'm getting not only a rotation of the tangent, I'm also getting a spin 
in the tangent plane. And that's what the omega-1-2 tells us. It's the, it's the rotation of omega-1-2 into this. <clears throat> and so what happens is, no, I better be careful. The omega-1-2 was k times sigma-1 wedge sigma-2. Minus k sigma one wedge sigma two. <clears throat> the aerial unit vector, the aerial unit entity in the tangent plane. That's what sigma wedge sigma one wedge sigma two is. The unit um, omega one two is the unit one form. And sigma one and sigma two are the the one forms corresponding to the f one direction and the f two direction, right? <clears throat> and when we integrate both of these around, the integral of sigma one sigma two gives me a little aerial the the, the size of the aerial region that we walked around for a sm for a small enough region, and I integrate d omega one two, and I get the integrated spin. And it's that spin that we're seeing in this parallel transport vector change. Now this, this uh, is gonna require you to get out a, uh, some surface and see what happens as you walk, walk around here. But as I said, essentially what's happening is at every stage, you're ignoring the rotation of the normal, which is to say the rotation of the tangent plane. And you're taking the same vector and just dropping it right back down infinitesimally onto the plane before it. <laughs> okay, and, and when you do that, that, that successive loss of curvature by that projection ends up producing this angular loss that is explained by this equation here, okay? And that angle loss is proportional to the area that you walked around and the Gaussian curvature in that area. Well, of course, it varies in that area, but if the area is small enough, we can just say the, the Gaussian curvature, let's say, at the center of that area. <clears throat> so the point is that from this, first of all, we have a way to, if you give me <clears throat> an angle lost, I can figure out what K is. <clears throat> the final, the other thing that we saw last time was that the integral of k over the whole surface, over a whole surface, is 2 pi times an integer, and that integer is 2 times twice the number of holes in the surface. Hi, David. <laughs> Uh, you, no, yeah, no, in my office is the problem. <laughs> uh, sorry for those listening on tape for the interruption. Uh, okay, so um, now we take a tile surface where now a A piece of surface is going to look like this, where this point is pulled out of the board. Right? And we play the same game here. We're gonna walk up, we're gonna walk around the path like this. Another color. Like so. There's a nice circuitous path. 
And we know that every place here is either flat or it's on a hinge, which is <coughs> which has um, <coughs> curvature zero along it and and principal curvature, whatever the swing of that, whatever the angle of that hinge is in the other one. And the product of those two is, is zero times something non-zero and non-infinite. And so the upshot is the Gaussian curvature is zero everywhere except at this vertex. And so all the Gaussian curvature is held in the vertices in a tiled in a tiled set. And um, and applying this angle loss thing for that track, there's going to be no angle loss for these flat bits. It all takes place at these hinges between the tiles. <coughs> and when you figure out that angle loss, you're going to be able to figure out what the Gaussian curvature is at that vertex. Yes, it's only one vertex. Yeah, this vertex here that we're walking around. Okay. Yeah, like for when you draw this uh, circle, like like shape, so it will intersect with uh, some edges. So at this intersection, you measure the the angle difference, and then you. We're going to put down any vector we want, say here. And we're going to carry it along here, and as we and as we swing around this edge, around this hinge, because this guy's pulled out, we're going to have to project that guy down onto the next tangent plane. <coughs> um, okay. okay. So, the, so every time we do the projection, we measure the angle difference. Then we no, every no, we don't worry about the angle. We just project, 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 project all the way around. And when we finish, we'll end up with a different vector. And we just look at the angle between those, the one we started and the one we finish. Okay. And we need to do this in a way that respects this gauss bonnet theorem. And this parallel transport method does exactly that. That is to say, it, and so, uh, so this method can be used for doing a consistent calculation of Gaussian curvature on a tiled surface that's consistent with the, the, the constraints of a continuous geometry. And if you do it in other ways, you don't. And to understand this better, I will refer you to a YouTube video by Keenan Crane, which does a very nice job of explaining all this in detail. Okay. One more thing I want to ask is about the unit of this, uh, the, the left part of the equation is radian. The units of? Uh, le left part of the equation, like the integral. This one here? Uh, the upper. Integral KDA? Yeah, the units of uh, well, K, K is in um, 1 over radians I mean, uh, uh, part, like squared. The, what? The, the integral of D omega 1, 2. Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. K is in radian squared. Wh which one? This one here? Uh, yeah, the second one. Oh, well, it's the same. D, D omega one two so integral. So the yeah. units of this and the units of that are the same. It's so it's radian squared times area on the surface, which is in millimeter squared. So I'm, I'm just to confirm like when I computed the so, so basically the 
if I want to compute the, the curvature to come over I can use uh, the method you described. So I can compute the, the area, right? So basically the area is the summation of all the triangles. So I can also uh, measure the the after I, I use one direction after I uh, travel around the circle. So what's the angle difference, right? This should mm -hmm. be the left part of the equation. So I use that value divided by the total area, so which should give me the the minus uh, Gaussian yeah, right. curvature. Right. right. I, <coughs> Uh, no, 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 no. I think I gotta be careful. So angle loss is is the uh, <coughs> sorry. Okay. It's the curvature divided by the area inside inside the thing I did a circuit of. Right. So to take the area of this piece of the surface <laughs> and find the angle lost and that's equal and that times the area of I get it right? Still still not right. Uh I'm going to have to let me let me recover from this gracefully by doing it next time, fixing it up next time. You, you, I've got I've got a little problem here, and I've got the right principle, but I've got a detail in the equation. Okay. As for the as for the Mean curvature. We can we know that the mean curvature is simply the <coughs> the swing. There's no mean curvature here. The, the the curvature here is the mean of zero along that direction, and whatever the angle of swing is, namely the angle between those two tiles, right? <clears throat> or put another way, twice the mean curvature is this angle around the circuit, is this angle plus this angle plus this angle plus this angle plus this angle between the respective tiles, the sum over all those hinges. <clears throat> and that's going to give you a total, a total uh, swing. And you want the total swing per <clears throat> per unit distance along that perimeter, if you will. <clears throat> uh, I got that slightly wrong too, because it, but anyway, the upshot is you end up being able to compute both the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature. And from that, you can use your equation turning H and K into kappa one and kappa two to get the principal curvatures. Okay, and the point is that the mean curvature comes from the from the swing about from the angles between the faces and the Gaussian curvature comes from the angle lost. Okay, like for mean curvature, I need to uh, accumulate all the angle difference for for the like neighboring faces. But for the uh, Gaussian curvature, I only need to measure the difference after I tra travel the okay. That's right. <laughs> okay. Now what about it for a parameterized surface? And you want kappa one and kappa two. Well, this has to do with something we looked at before, where you have a UV plane, and you're at a point in the UV plane, and we have a direction U and a direction V in that plane. And we have the surface represented as X of UV, Y of UV, Z of UV, which I write X underline of U underline. Clear? <laughs> this carries points on this points on the points on the tangent plane to the surface at the image of point at the place x of u v. This x of u is here. 
this point. And remember, we talked about M2 up there. And we talked, and, and that is to say that something that describes the swing of the normal. But if we, but if we take into account the metric change between here and here, <coughs> we end up with an M2 that is pulled back into the UV coordinate system that turns out to be of this form. If S is the normal at that point, it's simply minus S dot, and the four places are the second derivative in the U direction of the X function, the second derivative in the UV direction of the X function. UV here also, well, one of them is UV and one of them is VU, where UV is the, the subscript means partial derivative, right? <laughs> and the VV direction. So you get a two by two matrix, and it can be shown that what you're interested in is the maxima over all possible walking directions of two of TT, right? Because that's the normal curvature. And we want the maximum normal curvature, which co corresponds to the principal curvature. We proved before that the pure, the pure walking direction gives you a maximum and a minimum, I should say, the, both the max and the min, <coughs> of normal curvature. Walking direction in the tangent plane. So over all walking directions in the tangent plane, the kappa 1, 2 is max, I should say max and min respectively the max of this and the min of this overall walking directions. Two, de two separate results, one for the max, one for the min. Or I'm a little, little lost about the notation here, like you have this. Uh... So this thing is what we call K of T. So what, what was your question? Again, uh, my question was this. K, K was the normal, K was the, uh, the, the normal curvature, the component of okay. Of, of normal swing as we walk in that, in the walking direction when we walk in that direction. Okay? So, kappa 1, 2 was defined to be, or not defined to be, it was defined to be uh, the curvatures for pure, for pure uh, nosedive. But we showed before that pure nose, that the pure nosedive direction is also the max and the minimum direct values of normal curvature. And so if we write this, it turn, and now we say any t over here, um, Right. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> say this right. Let's try this again. I'm going to call this VV, just to, okay. So the maximum of all walking directions in the tangent plane, V. But the point is that for every T here, <coughs> there's a vector over here that's the image of T. <coughs> I'm going to call that V of T, which is just T1 XU 
plus T to XV. Sorry about this V and that V is not the same. I'll call that W just to fix up the, the naming convention. Now, walking direction in the tangent plane is W. W corresponding to T1 in the U direction and T2 in the V direction maps onto T1 XU plus T2 XV. And we want the maximum min over W equals one. So here, like the uh, X U and X V are the uh, two orthogonal direction, or I'm not sure orthogonal or not. Sure. They're not orthogonal, absolutely not. In but general, but orthogonal. they are in the, in the surface. They're, they're, yep, that's right. They're the two directions, they're in the tangent plane, here and here. One of them's X U and the other one's X V, and they're not necessarily orthogonal, they're normally not orthogonal. Okay, and so we have, we're talk, so let me, so we're trying to find the max or min with respect to W, where W is this, and so that what that ends up being is a, something that <laughs> optimizes if beta is the angle of t of this t vector in the in the tangent plane, <laughs> uh, you get um, uh, let me. I just don't have that board space, so I'm going to need to do some erasing here. I'm trying to get this up here. I'm missing a denominator here. Sorry for the. Okay, so I need cosine beta. Sine beta. Sorry for everybody, I've been grading exams and that's why I'm so inadequately prepared. Okay, so this guy is the metric tensor. Remember that, that the metric tensor between, that changes the metric from here to here is given by that. And so this mapping, Cos is the size of the, the vector t, which is at angle theta, over here, okay? And so what we're saying is that this is the swing of the normal fixed up, fixed up for the size. That is to say, overall, walking directions that are unit, unit length. Okay, what's beta? Well, it turns out that this max of min, you can take the appropriate derivatives of things, and it ends up that beta is, give, is given by an equation, somewhat complicated equation, the determinant of this three by three matrix is equal to zero. And the three by three matrix has and cosine two beta sine, these are not sine squares, these are sine of two beta. And this one is that right. Yeah, one plus cosine. Plus one minus cosine two beta minus sine two beta one plus cosine two beta along the top, and all these things that appear in M two down in the bottom row 
And all these things that appear in M1 in the middle row, X, U, X, U, X, U, X, V, X, V, X, V, that was this thing. And all the things that appear, the X, U, Vs in the, in the, M, in the M2 in here, that's, <coughs> that is a, basically a quadratic equation in cosine or si and sine of beta. Okay. And there would be two solutions. Yeah, one so for the max and one for the minimum. For the minimum. Okay. So uh, if I want to get the principal directions on the surface, so I need to uh, use like cosine beta, like uh, x u plus sine beta x v. So my question is how to get the x u and x v. Like, you have that? This is parameterized, so you have equations. X sub u is just the partial derivative of x u is simply d by du of x of u v y of u v z of u v and you have a you have parameterized you have analytic formulas for x of u v y of u v and z of u v so you can you know how to take those right <laughs> you just take d by du of them uh, and for v you take d by dv of them <laughs> and for u u you take the second derivative of that twice with respect to you and so on. Got it? <clears throat> so the point is these guys at any given point that you're trying to get the principal direction of, you know what these values are. All of these is solving for beta. And that gives you a print that gives you a vector here, which when you do this transform, W equals T1 X U plus T2 of X P, where T1 is cosine beta and T2 is sine beta. You've got now the principal direction up there on the tangent line. And we've got, and given that cosine beta sine beta, we now can use this ratio that I just talked about, this thing divided by that, with that, with that solution beta to give us the kappa one and the kappa two. Okay, it takes some, you know, it's, it's obviously a bit complex here, but that it all has to do with, on the one hand, you need to pull back the size from here to here, that's what the M1 does, and you need to pull back the uh, normal swing back to here, and then you solve the problem over here. And then once you solve it over there, you push it back forward, back onto the surface. Okay? Okay. So, enough about solving uh, for kappa one, kappa two, uh, and principal curvature and uh, Gaussian curvature and mean curvature in each of these two situations. Okay, then the next, um, so now taking, breaking off that topic. And So, remember, we talked about integral curves of principal direction. And we saw that at every position that isn't locally spherical, isn't an umbilic, that's just another name for locally spherical, you have two principal directions and you can follow the integral curves. Right, you walk a little direction in that principal, little distance in that principal direction, and then you're at a new place, and you can continue on in that the corresponding principal direction. And you get these these for the ellipsoid these curves that you get there. But I now want to talk 
about the asymptotic directions. And I remind you that the asymptotic directions are the directions of zero, uh, zero normal curvature, pure twist, only twist. Pure twist. That's called an asymptotic direction. And we show that asymptotic directions only exist in hyperbolic regions. But there couldn't be an asymptotic direction in a convex region. But in a the right. Uh, I think it was right going the other way. Okay, hold on. Let me find it. What, what have I done? Okay, so in figure 305 there, what you're seeing is a furrow, a hyperbolic region in, forget this hump, just the furrow in a convexity. Okay, so let's, it's just a banana shape. Let's make ourselves one here. Oh, God. There it is. Okay, so let's make ourselves something convex. And let's put a furrow in it. Okay? So now we've got a convex thing with a furrow in it. Except. And here's the boundary of the furrow. It's a parabolic curve separating the furrow from the convex region. And what we're seeing in that picture 305 is one end of the furrow, you know, sort of from here down, down a ways. Not clear? Okay. Okay. We're just seeing. The, this region here, and it's cut off there. It's just okay. So the the curve on the outside is the parabolic curve. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, what about that? Those are the asymptotic curves. Okay. So the asymptotic, the integral curves of asymptotic curvature. Um. <clears throat> go from one side of the furrow to the other side of the furrow, and they have this inflection in between them. And you will remember that at every point there are two asymptotic directions. And they bisect the principal, sorry, the principal directions bisect these two directions of asymptotic direction. Just to say, <clears throat> At any given point, we have two principal directions. And if it's a hyperbolic point, we have two asymptotic directions. And the principal directions, red, bisect the asymptotic directions, green. OK, so that's the, the picture here. We have a pair of asymptotic directions, not necessarily orthogonal to each other. and what you're seeing, for example, in figure 305, at one of the places where two curves cross here, those are the two directions. 
<laughs> this thing is dense with these curves. It's just showing a sampling of them, right? But at every point, there's two of them coming through. And those, the tangent of those asymptotic curves, those integral curves of asymptotic direction, are the two asymptotic directions. And in particular, when they come together right on the boundary of the furrow, I'll remind you that at that point, the two green curves coalesce and become a single asymptotic direction of multiplicity two. And that direction is the cylinder axis direction. And the cylinder axis direction, <coughs> let's look at a cylinder here. The cylinder axis direction is this direction along the cylinder. It's the flat direction. But after all, this is a kind of flatness, right? This asymptotic direction is no normal curvature. <coughs> And so these cylinder axis directions are simultaneously asymptotic twice and principal. These two green curves have swung together and they, they go, are in a principal direction. And that principal direction is the direction of, of flatness. That is to say, it's on the parabolic curve. I remind you, a parabolic curve is a place where one of the principal directions of zero and that corresponding principal direction to the zero curvature place is the direction that we see in each of these figures at the at the parabolic uh, at the parabolic curve. Okay, so the upshot is we end up being able to trace out the asymptotic curves. They, they can, the way they trace out these special places where everything comes together are called ruffles. They are the places where the principal direction is tangent to the parabolic curve. Everywhere else is transverse. And so in this example we saw here, they're going to be here and here, these two places at the, at the end. So, okay? And 305 and 306 can be proven to be the only layouts that you can have of these asymptotic curves in a furrow. Why the shape on the, the, the right-most figure? Hmm? Okay, say louder so that I can hear you. So why the shape of the right most figure is okay? Called, so uh, okay, so that's the other for the rightmost figure, three and seven. It's about the hump, not about the furrow. So now we've got a hump, a convexity inside. So now the the parabolic curve is a parabolic curve separating a convexity on the inside where there's no asymptotic curves from the furrow. So, furrow on the inside, convexity on the outside is 305, 306. Convexity on the outside, furrow on the inside. Sorry, convexity on the inside, furrow on the outside is 307. That's the hump. Okay? And so now, since the hyperbolic region's here now, that's in the middle is the hump that's convex. There's no asymptotic curves, no integral curves of asymptotic direction because there's no asymptotic directions in here. They're all outside here in the furrow. <laughs> and so what happens when you have a hump in a furrow, <laughs> here's the hump inside this green curve. This is a parabolic curve. <laughs> this is the hump. The green hump in a red furrow, and outside here is convex. All right. 
And if I haven't lost my black pen, oh, here it is. Okay, so this guy out here is convex. So this is hyperbolic. This is convex. This is convex. And what happens is you end up with the outside picture, the picture 307 up here, which ends up with things that, that look like that. And you and let's see, yeah, we're in a, and here inside here you have these. A picture like 305 or 306. Okay, so the patterns of these principal curves and asymptotic curves are what distinguish different kinds of shapes. Put another way, the patterns of the principal curves and the asymptotic curves tell us everything qualitative we need to know about patches of shape. And it turns out that there's, except for deformations, there's very small catalog of shapes. And that can be proven. And it's proven using the mathematics of singularity theory, which I obviously don't have time to go into great detail, but we'll give you a taste of in a minute. Okay. And so let us make some room. So, we have, first of all, the oval. It's purely convex, nothing interesting happens, except that there will be some umb umbilics. And that's what we saw in our ellipsoid, if I can find it again. Okay, so there is an ovoid. It's only convex. And what happens is everything is just very simple, except that there are generically some umbilics. And the umbilics are places where the two families coalesce in every direction is a principal direction. And that's all that happens. So you have uh, no asymptotic curves and uh, umbilics radiating principal directions. and orthogonal principal directions everywhere else. All right. <coughs> the next thing <coughs> that happens is the furrow. I get a furrow by taking an ovoid. And starting to press down on it. Okay, and eventually what's going to happen is out of nowhere is going to become an infinitesimal furrow created out of nothing. And then it's going to grow as I push down further and further and further. And it's going to have the pattern across the furrow of Okay, so here's the furrow. And roughly speaking, I'm going to have these principal directions that are, are going to cross it this way, and which are going to have the convex negative curvature here, and then positive curvature there, and the negative curvature there. And I'm going to have the other family of principal directions that are orthogonal to those, 
and nothing inside happens in interesting. Right, in other words, they just cross each other. There's no umbilics in there. <coughs> and these guys here are purely convex and have purely negative curvature, okay? And later when we get to concave, for everything I'm gonna tell you, there's, I'm gonna say plus the mold. So the mold of a convex region is concave. It's simply, the air, it's what the air is. When this, uh, it's the shape of the, the air as the thing, rather than the surface as the thing. Okay, so you understand if you use this as as some as some as as a basic thing, and then you make a mold, you'll you'll get the thing that was convex is now going to be concave, and the place that was hyperbolic is going to be hyperbolic. <clears throat> okay, no, I'm not going to tell you about the mold. They're just the same story as these guys. <laughs> okay, so a furrow is a hyperbolic region. hyperbolic in a convex C. And that's a basic shape that you can get as generic. And you can get transitions into it by starting to push down on your ovoid at some point. <clears throat> Next thing that can happen is the hump. Here's our furrow, and now we're gonna start pulling out in the middle of the furrow, and you get that. And it turns out to be very much the same sort of process as the furrow in the, in the convexity. It's just that across here, we're gonna have negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. We're gonna have two crossings on either side of the uh, of parabolic curves to cross zero crossings of the principal curvature. And not, again, nothing interesting happening that way. And still checkerboard, no umbilics, nothing much interesting happening. The next thing that can happen, okay, that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run out of time, but okay, let's, drop, let's finish the catalog. The next thing that can happen is we take this furrow and we bend it around. Okay, so I'm going to take this thing and pull it around like so. Nothing interesting happening until the tail and the two the two ruffles coming bite each other, <laughs> right? The, this guy here and this guy here come and touch each other and the whole thing coalesces. This is a special kind of singularity <coughs> uh, called a Beeks event. <laughs> and here, Remember, this was the furrow, so this is the hyperbolic part, this is the convex part, and now I've got a, a convex thing in the middle of a hyperbolic thing in the middle of a convex thing, which is what I had here too, but now the principal curves that used to be checkerboard, one of, them's, one of them has become circumferential and the other ones become radial. And so it turns out in doing that, you generate an umbilic. Or you have an umbilic. And you have a pattern of principal curves that are circumferential and radial. And that's the pair. You get a pair by taking a furrow and then wrapping it around on itself to get this circular thing that attached itself to made this neck. And it's gonna have a umbilic here and an umbilic down there. 
Okay. And after that, there's just one more, and that's the complicated one. I'm going to leave that to next time. That's the dimple. Uh, in the pump, it's these radial curves that have all the crossings of the zero crossings of the of the principal curvature. The circumferential curves don't have any. They're the, are the, they're the part of this picture that we had with the furrow, <coughs> where this vertical part where there weren't any crossings. And the horizontal part is what's where it had all the crossings, is what's turned into the radial part. <coughs> what happens in the dimple is you still have this picture with umbilics, <coughs> but in fact, you can show that the one of the one of the principal curvatures, zero crossings, comes from the radial and one from the circumferential pattern <laughs> instead of both from the radial. And it turns out there's three kinds. There's an early pre-dimple. And there's a later pre-dimple. And then there's a full dimple. And it ends up that what happens is that if you have a, a convexity and you push down it, you get a furrow. And as you push down further, you get an early, you get a concavity, which is an early pre-dimple. And if you push down more, you get a later pre-dimple. If you push down a lot, <laughs> you get the full dimple. So to keep pushing down, you get eventually a concavity in here. So what the case under the dimple and furrow? And the far, well, you have to go through a furrow in any case. Okay, you go from convexity. The only thing you can get from a convexity is a furrow. After furrow, you can either wrap the furrow around on itself and get a pair, or you can pull out on the furrow and get a hump, or you can push down further in the furrow and you get a concavity. No, you better. You, okay, you okay. You'd better get that out of your head that they're anything like the same thing. One one is a hyperbolic region, the other is a concavity. That is to say, it's an elliptic region. And there is this common um, misintuition, <laughs> uh, intuition misleading intuition that somehow a concavity is like a furrow, like a hyperbolicity, and it isn't. Just, it's just as different from a furrow as a convexity is from a furrow. The ones the hyperbolic with two negative principal curvatures. Okay, so I cut you off. You want to ask your question? So, uh, I, just, uh, I understand the, the red part of, of, of the straight type, but, but from the uh, dimple, like, what you mean is like you have you first have a, a convex object like a, like this ellipsoid, and then you 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 push down you 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 get a, a furrow, then you push down further you get you get a deep uh, like uh, early like dimple. I don't quite understand like uh, this is just uh, the degree of how you push down why it causes a different shape type. Well, <clears throat> well, you'll see it's it's the. The dimple is so complicated that we won't be able to cover it fully in this short course. But um, it turns out that the the process of producing a dimple uh, ends up with one one curve with four ruffles on it and, and another one with none. 
Okay, so the hump, get a ruffle here and a ruffle here. And a ruffle here and a ruffle there on the outside. Everything has two ruffles. Every parabolic curve has two ruffles, one at each end. What, what's your uh, ruffle? It was the place where the place where the oh, okay. where the principal curve is a, is tangent. The hyperbolic, and you end up with four or more can be a zillion ruffles in the dimple on a single curve, and that never happens for a never happens for a furrow or a or a hump. <laughs> And so you put in a furrow and you get two, and you push down further and you get two more, and then some some amazing thing happens where the 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 ruffles of one of the curves swaps swap themselves to be ruffles of the other parabolic curve when the, when they two meet. Wild and wonderful thing that you can prove has to happen. We have to stop today. Um, I'm